Hey, it's Nick Vial, host of The Vile Files, and I'm here to remind you to check out our show. Do you like reality TV? Are you interested in pop culture? Are you fascinated with relationships? Or are you struggling in your own relationship? Well, there's something for everyone here at The Vile Files, whether it's Ask Nick on Monday, our reality recap episodes that break down your favorite reality TV and pop culture moments, or our Going Deeper episodes that give you the blockbuster interviews with some of your favorite celebrities out there. Either way, we have something for everyone, so check out The Vile Files wherever you get your podcast. Listen, context matters. Confront reality sooner. Welcome to Paper Napkin Wisdom, where we share pearls of wisdom shared by some of the world's top entrepreneurs, leaders, and difference makers. Here's your host, Govin Jayaraman. Hi, my name is Govin Jayaraman, and this is Paper Napkin Wisdom, episode number one. 164. If this is your first time here, make sure to subscribe. Paper Napkin Wisdom on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, everywhere you listen to your favorite podcast. And also don't forget our other short podcast, Five Minutes at a Time, Take Action by Paper Napkin Wisdom. Also subscribe in all the same places. Listen, if you are a longtime listener to Paper Napkin Wisdom, you might remember Christina Harbridge. She was here in episode 47. Today, we're going to talk about how context matters. You're going to love this episode. Christina is amazing as usual. Let's listen in. I am truly excited to have Christina Harbridge back on Paper Napkin Wisdom. Christina, welcome to Paper Napkin Wisdom. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me again. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, 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 I love my conversations with Christina and Christina, if you haven't listened to her podcast or previous episode, it's going to be in the show notes for this episode. Amazing, amazing thought leader, amazing perspective on just about everything. I love our offline conversations beforehand and afterhand, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this one and everybody listening, you're in for a treat today because she's really got a great paper napkin. And I'm, I'm just totally curious about what you you know, what you sent. So can you describe your paper napkin for everyone listening? I can. And um, so it's a visual um, with, uh, that shows levels of context, uh, which is um, a habit that can help communication. So if you think about levels of context, if I was to say fruit, fruit is a food. Food is more abstract. Um, if I were to say apple, that is a more specific context to fruit. Uh, Govin, name a name a, a kind of apple. What kind of apple is in your head? Honeycrisp. So you said a Honeycrisp apple. The one I was thinking of was Granny Smith. So you just brought me the wrong freaking apple. Um, yeah. And so Granny Smith is at a level of specificity that creates understanding, but it's often not specific enough. So... Yeah, on the visual, it shows a circle. Um, so imagine if I ask you for uh, a piece of apple, and instead of that honey crisp, uh, I take that apple, I take a bite in it, and there's half a worm squiggling out of it, implying the other half is in my mouth. That is a level of context that has feeling and specificity that both people can understand and find themselves in. It's a different apple than the one you were thinking of. Totally different apple. Yeah. And so the visual that you're looking at uh, shows all the different levels of context that people can talk about and speak in. And everyone has their habits by which they speak in. And, and inside companies, you know, buzzwords are a buzzkill. But we, man, we throw buzzwords around and we think that we've communicated and we actually haven't. And so it's a deliberate practice for people to use to notice if they even understand what the conversation is that people are having. So and how, how would we use that? Like, I mean, it, it, this is a, this, this is a big subject. Like, how do I use that? Where do I start? Um, you use the napkin to wipe your tears because communication is hard. And, <laughs> <laughs> and here, let me, let me say it this way. I'm a total hack and I don't have a lot of discipline. So I create deliberate practices that are really easy to do because it's very hard to change a habit. If something requires discipline, it's going to be hard for me to do it. So context is a deliberate practice that if someone practices it for a few weeks of noticing context everywhere, um, it will become more of a habit so that they're increasing understanding. 
And that sounded like a bunch of freaking jargon. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, levels of context can be used in public speaking. Uh, there's a difference between a presenter being about a subject and being in it. Mm-hmm. Let me be more specific. If I'm storytelling and I'm saying, I'm going to tell you about a time uh, I was embarrassed, that is not the warm level of storytelling. And it makes people feel like they're in a transactional moment. But if I say to you, I'm standing in front of the California legislature, I'd had a shot of tequila, I had seven hives on my face, and I'm about to legislate on a bill. And as I turned around, my slip fell down. That's storytelling at a context level that has more value to an audience. And I'll stop there. I can list the other ways you can use it. But I wanted to stop there and let you ask me a question if you have one. Yeah, I do. So how do I know that I'm just, because sometimes context can feel too granular too, right? Can't it? Can it, can I just get lost in details? And sometimes we hear someone talking and it's all about the detail and it's never about the story and you're waiting for that to come together. How do you, how do you balance that line? Tequila. (laughs) (laughs) This, I think this is sometimes the struggle that happens in companies. So let me answer it this way, because there is no easy answer to it. So whenever there isn't an easy answer, we use a lot of words to describe something. A complaint means a person stands for something. And often people complain at the food and fruit level. So they'll say, uh, we suck at collaboration. A CEO who only wants high level will say, great, fix that, and sort of shush them out of the office. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Uh, There's only so much information we can take in. But if that CEO is practicing this context thing, and they're like, okay, a complaint means a person stands for something. What are they standing for? And ask them for an example. What are you seeing? What's one example of not collaborating? And that person says, we pay 37% more with this vendor because we keep getting the height of the counter wrong. That is a very different conversation than go fix collaboration. That's okay. I want you to get product engineering together, sit in a room and tell me what the plan is. And so it works two ways. Um, It gets the examples that can drive change And it also fills a person's basic need to feel understood. And because a lot of us want to keep really good people, when they're complaining, we can shush them out of the room or we can get an example so we can either fix a problem or invest in their need to feel understood so they stay engaged. And and I want to go ahead. No, no, sorry. I mean, I, I, I'm actually really hanging on this now because the way that you changed the context of that use for me really became a, a leadership skill that we could build too, right? In terms of our communication, because when we're leading people, we need to get that context. We need the contextual conversation. We don't want just the fruit or food context. We need the detail. And sometimes practicing getting there in those individual conversations can help us do it more regularly overall, right? Yeah, it's a deliberate practice. It's getting the example because people tend to complain in buzzwords and they think they've told you, but they haven't told you anything. You know, so if if someone says, I think we need to work on psychological safety in our company, and you're like, oh, people just need to have the guts to speak up, like, or go talk to HR about that. But then a month later, you find out your head of sales has been sexually harassing someone. You want to know about that sooner. So it's asking that person for an example, fills their need to be understood, but it also gives the CEO data. It doesn't mean they take on solving the problem. So that's where a lot of us get tripped up, that if we hear the example, we're taking ownership away. We're not. We're driving the resource based on the example. Yeah, and I think this is this is a really big part because I think a lot of entrepreneurs get caught in this challenge solving, problem solving mentality, right? I mean, this idea that we are here to solve challenges and we 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 don't move beyond to leading 
We don't move beyond to under, understanding the context so that we're not solving the problem. We're leading our teams to a solution. And that's a very fine difference, but it's a very important one. And I have an unpopular opinion about that, <laughs> is that I think the job of a leader is to confront reality sooner and then improve upon the reality. And often the way to get that is listening to buzzwords and complaints. Confront reality sooner. Confront reality sooner. To have the physiology that is okay with not being okay. That if my business is being disrupted, I want to know about that as soon as possible. Um, And that often comes out in people's fruit and food level complaints. And if we can just get the example, now what can happen is they don't have an example. So that's a whole nother like, hey, don't throw around, don't say we don't collaborate. Well, that will become a mantra. Unless you have an example, stop that. You can coach your person to stop being a complainer if that's what they're doing. But that's also confronting reality sooner, right? I mean, that's confronting the reality of that moment sooner because everyone's just complaining. Yes, exactly. So context helps you understand if it's just a complaint or if there really is a contextual example behind what is going on, what's behind that communication, what's behind that high-level complaint. Exactly. Can I give you another example? Because this Absolutely. model is all about examples. <laughs> Absolutely. So here's an example. A CEO is sitting in his office, and uh, the head of product comes in and says, you know, our CFO is really pushing deadlines without taking into context everything that we have going on. And the CEO says, oh, okay, I'll talk to him about that. Well, what are you, you're going to talk to him about what? So you say to that head of product, give me an example of that. Well, the budget. And the, the, they give a very clear example. Well, let me get the CFO in here right now and let's talk it through. And the real problem was that head of product knew the deadline eight weeks ago. They just delayed working on it and didn't have time to do it. It was a teaching moment for that head of product, not a problem with the CFO. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I I think that context is really important. It is, and it teaches leaders to be careful what they say because that head of product saying that to their team member builds a reputation about the CFO that messes with the company, and it's not true. Yeah. And, 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 you know, by doing this repeatedly, right, when make, you make this a practice, when this is something that you do by design on an ongoing basis, and it's a predictable thing, right? I mean, you know, leadership has to be predictable to be really successful. And, and when you make this a predictable thing, the way you've just talked about it, that this is the context is going to be needed. It, it takes away that high, that, 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 that whiny complaint from even coming to you because people need to show up with an example. They know that that's the first thing you're going to ask. And things start getting fixed. Yeah, but it's, it's, before. It, we, we put this model into a poster and people are putting it in their conference rooms. My friends, I kind of made it into a poster. And I'm just like, in meetings, if people would ask for an example, when a complaint happens, it changes everything. Things get fixed. Because we're no longer talking in buzzwords. You know, we suck at execution. All right, give me an example of that. So with yeah. this model, we can practice it in those situations, but we can practice in, in parenting, asking questions that get our kids to tell us the worm story, not the apple story. We can practice it in how we give people feedback, no longer using superlatives, good and great. Instead, we can give specific examples of what they're doing well. Do you want an example of that one? Absolutely. So let's say, for example, you just did a sales call and I was in the meeting with you And um, I say to you, that was, hey, you did a really great job. Good job. And I walk out and I think, I got to talk to to him about his slides. The slides are too long. And you leave being like, see, I told you the slides were right. I'm going to tell my boss that I should have that many slides. If I give fruit level feedback to people, they're going to do more of probably what I didn't like. Because I didn't tell them specifically, hey, I think the way that you handled those tough questions, when he said uh, we sucked at customer service, most people would have caved. Govin, you drove the points home. That was, that was amazing. 
you've got 17 slides, make it three. That is feedback that's at the warm level that still feels good, but it's giving people specific feedback. And it's, it's the reality, right? It's, it's actually the reality of the situation. Like you said, it's confronting reality sooner. It's, it's actually dealing with that rather than hanging on the buzzwords of add a boy, add a girl, walking away and then coming back and having to unwind. But I thought, but I thought, I didn't just tell me it's, it's all based on assumptions at that point. Everybody's, everybody's actually conveying an assumption when we're talking at fruit or food level. And good job, great job doesn't stick with people. When you tell someone that they've got a superhero power about turning a tough question like that around, that sticks with people. And it knows where, and, and it tells people where to go, right? When, when in that situation again, go back there, not add 10 slides. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't typically put a positive and then a negative because I hate that freaking formula that was created 50 years ago by I think like Dale Carnegie training, say the positive, say the negative. The, one the way manager. that I gave people, I wouldn't typically do because that feels transactional to people. Um, so I would probably say, hey, three slides next time. If you, you know, or I, I put the negative first if I do have a correction. Yeah. And what changes just, when you do that? What changes when you do that? I know it goes back to this, this idea, and this is really what it's been about, is about confronting reality sooner. But what changes in the dynamic when you put that negative up front? So all of us know the formula of you know positive plus negative. I, I, a lot of people give the positive and the negative. So because people know that formula, when you give them the positive, they don't even hear it because they're waiting for the negative. So if you go up to your spouse tonight and say, hey, I love that you'd make coffee for me every morning of our marriage, thank you, and walk away, what is she going to say? What was that for? Yeah, what do you want? The reason why she says that is because we've used positive feedback as manipulation in our culture. We tell people we like something to get something or to tell them what's wrong with them. So uh, in terms of context, if we're going to thank somebody, we want to have a specific thank you. I love that you make coffee every morning of our marriage and walk away. The positive completely stands alone. Correction can stand alone too, or you can put it first so that they hear the positive. Yeah. And you know what's amazing about that? This actually just happened to me yesterday. I remember uh, I was, I was away uh, at, at, a, at a speaking engagement, I was going to the airport and I said something to my wife that was just very positive and I just thanked her for her support on something and that was it. And she said, where's this coming from? And, and it, it totally feeds, it, it, it totally backs up exactly that experience. And I'm sure everyone listening right now can think back to those times when people do something nice for someone just to do it and people are wondering when the other shoe is going to fall. And the, using this model, um, the practice is to spotlight the behavior we want to see. So if I want, uh, if I'm in a company and I want people to be more responsive, I need to spotlight that when people are super responsive, give examples of it when it happens. Uh, if, if when everybody, if anybody's late in the meeting, we talk about the people who are late, not the people that have been sitting there for five minutes. I really appreciate, Susie, you have never been late to this meeting once. You say that one time, people will tend to not be late. You didn't tell them they were late. You just acknowledge the person who is never late. Yeah, looking for what you like, going back to your first paper napkin. I, I think incredible. And incredible how it all comes together. Christina, I want, I want you to think back to, and, and you know, you're, you're a thinking person when it comes to communication, and this, this may have come very natural to you for a long time, but think of a time before this, the, the concept-based conversation, this idea that you're confronting reality sooner, before that was a deliberate act, before you were doing it all the time. What did, what did your relationships look like then versus now? How has it changed your life? Um, I would sit in my executive team meetings and expect things that I had never really asked for. 
because my team couldn't translate translate my fruit or food level asks or complaints into action. And so I would be frustrated with people for having 17 slides, but I never asked them to change anything. There was this, in my company, I feel like there was this guessing game. And because I'm a really nice person, if you know me, I love people. It's very hard to piss me off. So I would let it go and forgive and be kind until it all built up on me. And then one day, like a missed document would really upset me. And I would I would go off on people. And I was fine. I was a great leader, like 95% of the time. But 5%, this tolerating that I was doing over these buzzword things that were happening would, 5% of the time, I would be like Linda Blair with my head spinning around. And that's the times I would lose people. I would lose their commitment. They'd forget all the 95%. And so before I really started practicing this, I, I would be more frustrated. We would have less things fixed. And I knew less about the kids in my life, the people in my life. Now I know so much about the people in my life because I don't ask, how are you? I don't ask questions, how was school today? I ask questions that get the person to give me details and examples. And I get their story. And I am starting to tear up right now. We are one story away from our closest friends. And when I think at our, uh, you know, I know you're not in our country, but in the United States, man, it is so divided right now. And I really believe if people heard each other's story at a specific level of context, we could do so much more to fix the big problems of the world. And so that's what changed for me. Uh, it's so powerful. And I, and I know you've, you've taken to recently sharing some of those individual stories, those stories of connection when, and you did it with me. And I know that you always do that with me. When we, when we got on the phone together immediately, you asked me how I was doing, and I said, fantastic. And you said, tell me about that. And it, and it launched me into this beautiful story that I otherwise wouldn't, wasn't going to share with you. But it did bring us closer, right? I mean, it brings people closer when we hear that story of what's behind how they're feeling. And the mind remembers what's most vivid, so you become more real to me. So next time I, you know, I shared, you told me a story and I found myself in your story. I feel exact, you know, when I go out, I feel exactly the same way. And so it makes me feel like you're, you're part of my tribe, which is, you know, I really think this is our challenge in our society is the email, the, the phone and this fruit food level keeps us from finding ourselves in other people so that we are more willing to listen to them. Doesn't email and text and those forms of communication keep us on that superficial level, on, yes. on the buzzword level, on the LOL level of communication? Totally does. Uh, we're, we're, missing, we're, we're missing the depth um, and the feeling and feeling understood. Uh, email uh, is such a cha- it's such a challenge. We have a whole email process, we wrote about it because email is, is in my view, reducing so much performance um, in companies and not just time management, it's attention and it's feelings. Changed for you in your organization when you, you, when you wrote that document and you changed the way you use tools like email? in your organization? How has it changed our organization? Um, your we, relationships. Yeah, we're, we, what's the, an example way to talk about this? It doesn't, if, if someone, if something goes wrong, it doesn't matter how many emoticons we put in an email, it's going to sound snarkier than we wrote it. So in our company, we have this thing called go live, which is we all just jump on the phone and talk about it. It takes five minutes and then it's done. Um, we believe that you shouldn't express concern by email. Uh, it, it doesn't come off right. It's better to just have a minute call. Just do a call. Um, if you do have to express concern by email, it's calling that out. 
It's like, hey, I have to express this concern for a matter of time, but I want to get in the call. I care about you. We just put something in it to remind everybody this doesn't isn't read the way you're taking it. Um, the other thing we do is the subject, we use the subject line different, which I know we don't have time to go into. If you want a copy of it, I'll give it to you. Um, we, uh, the subject line drives the action. So the person getting the email doesn't have to open it to know what it is and what to do with it. Yeah, we do things like that too, a little bit, but I'd love to see what you're sharing. You know, Christina, I, I don't know how this always happens. Our, our time just evaporates. It, it, let's, let's, let's just bring it all together and give everybody listening because we've talked a lot about a lot of different things. Just, you know, let's, let's bring it back together to talk about one thing that people can do starting today to confront reality sooner and get to the worm level of conversation. What's one thing they can implement right away? Give, get, and ask for example. With give, give first. Give examples. Give examples. So if I tell someone I want something right away or ASAP, that's a buzzword. ASAP means when does that, does that mean drop everything? You know, I need this by 2 p.m. today. That's different. So give examples of what you want. If you're giving direction, give it. Be, be more specific. Um, get it means if some, a complaint means a person stands for something. If your kid says, I hate school, instead of correcting, telling them they have to go to school, it's good for them. Say, why do you hate school? Give me an example. If they say the teacher put her hand over my mouth today, that's a totally different conversation than the one you thought you were having. Um, and then ask for examples. So when, when uh, you're in meetings and people are throwing around buzzwords, get an example. Yeah, powerful. And another way to look at it is stories. So in, per, in our personal lives, example feels a little transactional. So it's uh, get the person's story. Ask questions so they tell you their story, not a superlative about how their weekend was. Phenomenal. Christina, as usual, thank you for joining me. Can I bring you back again? Oh, absolutely. And let me know if you want me to send you a link. We have this all written out, this context yeah. thing. Please do, yeah. and we'll, we'll include it in the show notes for everybody. Okay. Thanks, son. What a great conversation, Christina. Thank you for being on the show. And I want to say that after I had this conversation, I actually realized how often we hear jargon in the world around us and how easy it is to get sucked into the labeling that comes along with it. We think we understand what those terms mean, but they just are so vague and don't ever, almost ever actually relate to what the real problem is, right? We need to think about what's really specifically behind the actual complaint or the issue. If we, if we find the context, the example all the time from our team, we can dig deeper and help them and help them understand what's really going on and coach them to a greater level of success. And as a leader, that is our role. Our role is to be that of a coach, coaching our teams to understand how we make decisions, where they come from, and what to do next time. So think about it. When we confront reality, we can actually deal with the real issue. We can deal with the real feeling. We can see if there's anything else behind it. We can understand the real challenge, figure out what our teams really want, figure out how we can support them. And then finally, if we actually do this thing, if our team decides to move forward in that basis, what do we need to do around it? What else does it impact? And what was really helpful about the conversation is that we actually can get to the articulate need that is really important, right? And practicing this with repeating those types of questions, those contextual questions that I just asked over and over actually helps us as an organization, as a leadership team, as leaders evolve. You know, it's one thing to be a leader – it's another thing to have a team that follows like leaders and following like leaders is, is 
moving beyond just the contextual or the, the, the buzzword complaint, the high-level complaint, to something that's deeper and more important behind it. Specific examples. Change the complaint into a solution. Context is deliberate practice, and we have to notice it everywhere in order to increase our understanding of our business, our core issues, our bigger issues, the things that we need to do. And I love this idea that when we're going from the outside in, we can just talk in vague generalities, or we can get right down into the core, the core. And she Christina talked about this core being an apple, right? And on the outside, you could describe it as food. You get a little bit closer, it's fruit. Get a little bit closer, it's apple. Get a little bit closer, you describe it as a Granny Smith. And you can even get a little bit closer and say a Granny Smith is green and it's a little bit tart. Or you get even a little bit closer and you get a half bite in and there's a worm. Well, it changes the whole thing. Is that food anymore? No. Not at all. And... By adopting this practice, Christina shared how she became a bigger leader, not just in her professional life, but also in her personal life. So how can you begin to practice specificity, practice this idea of context mattering, pursuing context, confronting reality sooner? And as a leader, I mean, I I think this is brilliant, confront reality sooner. Amazing. Again, if this is your first time on Paper Napkin Wisdom, subscribe by searching Paper Napkin Wisdom on all your favorite podcast tools, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Don't forget to also subscribe to Take Action by Paper Napkin Wisdom, our short weekly podcast where you get a short five minute hit. Go to Facebook, search Paper Napkin Wisdom for behind the scenes stuff. And finally, my name is Govan J. Raman. This is Paper Napkin Wisdom. Make it a great day.